Samantha Henderson and Dominic Isom were a couple who were considered inseparable. Sanzo mum described them as like Barbie and Ken, and they had a lot of love for each other. But as the years progressed, so too did the cracks begin to appear in their relationship, one of the main ones being a lack of trust. So when Dominic called the police one morning to report that Sam had left the night before and hadn't returned, there was immediate panic amongst her friends and family. This was so unlike her, and no matter what was happening in the relationship, she would never have abandoned her children. When her beaten body was discovered in a lake, the true sinister reality would emerge that Dominic, Sam's perfect man, had actually been responsible for her brutal murder. This is the murder of Samantha Henderson. No! Hi guys, thanks for joining me. If you are new to my channel, I release my crime content on a Wednesday and a Sunday. Occasionally there will be extra videos that are not on those days, but I will always consistently deliver on a Wednesday and Sunday. So if you like crime content and you like consistency, this is most definitely the channel for you. So if you haven't subscribed yet, why don't you subscribe, get your notifications on so you will never miss an episode. Go on, it'll only take you like a second. And if you haven't and you're returning here, then why haven't you? a perfect opportunity to do something new today. Let's get on with today's case. So who was Samantha Henderson? Well, she's described as a really kind, warm-hearted, generous and loving individual by her mother. Her friends talked about the fact that she was the kind of person that you'd want because she was a loyal friend. Apparently, her mother said that if there was anybody who was the underdog, Sam would just gravitate towards them and she had this natural tenacity for including them. She had a real proclivity for trying her best to make everybody feel that sense of value and she had this strong belief that standing up for what was right was really important. So I think it gives us an introduction to the type of character that Samantha was. She's an individual who has those qualities about her that makes even the most ostracised individual feel included. And that says something very generous about her nature. Now, in early 2009, Sam has what I would consider is a sliding doors moment in her life. She sees Dominic Isom. And this is when she basically is walking along with a friend and he passes her in the street. And there's just something about the way he looks, the way he walks, just something that triggers that feeling of attraction towards him and she immediately fancied him so as she's walking along with a friend and chatting away she finds out from that friend that she knows who Dominic Isom is and she wants to get his number she basically wants to be able to have some kind of connection with him because she's so taken by Isom and the way that he looks and obviously has this intrigue about who he may be in her life if she makes contact but her friend doesn't necessarily want to connect them because he's actually in a relationship so this is not going to put Samantha off she's decided that at the end of the day she wants to know whether this could lead somewhere so when her friend isn't looking and she's otherwise engaged, she sneakily goes on her friend's phone and gets his number. So that shows us a level of confidence that's relatively unusual. And it also means that she's somebody who goes out and tries to get what she wants to have in her life. So she's also clearly somebody who makes a decision and then works towards achieving whatever that decision it involves. So she's definitely got determination within her spirit. So she texts him and he responds. They immediately hit it off. And those text messages clearly get to a point where they feel that they want to see each other. So they meet up. And I would imagine it was a sense of fireworks because even though they are both in other relationships and they're both in scenarios where they shouldn't, by rights, be actually connecting with another person, these things happen in life. We all know they do. And I think that... If there is a particular spark between two individuals, it can be very, very challenging to subdue that. And they are young, 
they are probably thinking about the rest of their lives and ultimately that those lives may be spent with the wrong person because they've got such a connection. So they do start to actually see one another. But because they are in relationships with other people, in the end, I some actually text Sam and lets her know that he cannot continue the relationship because they are actually seeing other people and he wants to make a go of the relationship that he's in. So they end up separating, but Sam really struggled with it. She told her mum that he was constantly on her mind and that she couldn't stop thinking about Isom and obviously it created a real grief within her. And we all know that it's not right to get involved in other relationships when we're in a committed relationship ourselves. That goes without saying, but these things do happen. And for Sam, Isom represents more than a fling. He represents a future as far as she's concerned. So this constant ruminating and thinking about him is very classic when you have a fixation on somebody. It can almost feel obsessive because of the fact that you are not with them, but you feel that you should be with them. And you play out all of the dramas in your head because they're with somebody else. And it can be very overwhelming. And clearly the fact that she can't let him go out of her mind, that's also gonna amplify the feelings because you're living a one-way narrative. So you're building pictures and possibilities that the other person isn't involved in. And you can create some pretty amazing fantasies about how it would be. And the problem with that is it's based not in reality, but in fantasy. So you've amplified who they are and what they mean to you without really having a relationship to evidence that that's the truth, that that's the reality of the feeling that you have. Instead, the reality of the feeling that you have is based on a fantasy that you've created for yourself. And the problem with this is she's basically placing him on a pedestal and she's amplifying feelings that is based on that false idea. And the problem with that is that should you actually get with that person, so return to the relationship, you've built them up on these false representations within your head that they are never going to likely achieve what it is you want for them to achieve because it was based on the standards that you would have created if you'd have had it perfectly your way. And that's not how relationships work. So when they are separate, she's still very much connected to him. And like I said, likely building these fantasies in her head, which is completely normal, but can have problems associated with it. Now, what Sam is unaware of to some degree is that Isom is also feeling exactly the same way about her. He's reciprocating these feelings and he's missing her and he's grieving their relationship. And during the period that they are separated and they're back with their respective partners, he basically can't stop thinking about Sam at all. And in 2011, so this is a good two years after their initial separation, they basically meet up again at a gym. And it's immediate. All of those feelings that they've been trying to swallow down, they are very present immediately. And so there's this intensity right from the start and it moves really quickly. So as they get involved in the relationship again, bear in mind, as I said, they've both been thinking about each other for two years, missing each other for two years, believing the, how the relationship would have been if they'd been together for two years. So at this point, their expectations of how this relationship would be, it's in the stars. It's in pure fantasy land. And like I said, that is psychologically problematic because you're competing with an image of what you've created versus the reality of a relationship. And we all know everyone's been in a relationship. Initially, it's great. And then two, three, four years down the line when you're like, I'm not sure that I should have to impart the advice about the floor not being a wardrobe. It can grate on you, can't it? So if you've got this beautiful image of how they were going to be, they're very often going to fall short. Even early on, the likelihood is they're going to fall short. So this is what happens. They connect, it's passionate, it moves really quickly. They are fully intoxicated with one another. And so essentially they want to fast track their relationship and where it's going. And Sam is really happy at this point and it doesn't take long for them to get engaged. And her mum actually said, quote, you could see lit up her world and meant everything to her. And this is exactly what we'd expect to see in the beginning of a relationship because lots of different things are going on on the psychological and physiological level. You're thinking, is this person the person I'm going to procreate with? So it's 
primordial. You're actually considering, is this individual somebody that I want to mate with? And that means that you're very lustful. It means that you feel super connected and bonded because it's building the possibilities of you having babies together. That's the reality. And then the other thing is the social norms that she's grown up with, which is that idea that there is going to be a man who's going to light up her world and carry her forward into her future because we're brought up in our Western psyche with that belief system, whether it's realistic or otherwise, it exists. And so he is fitting that paradigm of possibility for her. And it's making her feel that she has achieved that dream to meet somebody who she can genuinely picture her future with and that she can picture her family with, which is a powerful, powerful connector and motivator. But what we also know is that these levels of intensity at the beginning of relationships can sometimes hold a toxicity as well. Because when something feels immense and intense and it obsesses you because of the fact that they fill your world up in a variety of ways that feels ultimately new because you've got that special connection with them. If the trajectory of that relationship doesn't consistently fulfill that ideal fantasy, toxification can occur. We see that constantly in relationship therapy where people have this idea of how it's going to be and initially the intensity is just enormous and consumes them but then real life takes over and feelings change not that you don't love the person or like the person as much as you did just that the world gets more normalized so your vision of your feelings also changes and from that point sometimes more problematic features can find themselves infecting the relationship and i think that this is what's going to happen where sam is concerned that she had all of these amazing evocative experiences when she first met Isom and she really believed that he was going to fulfill her fantasies and fulfill her dreams but as the relationship becomes more normalized she also starts to recognize some of those initial feelings that she had towards him may well have been rose-colored and the true reality of her relationship is that they are not quite the perfect couple that she believed they were now, in early 2013, the family moved to Corf Castle, but they start arguing quite a lot there. And the vast majority of those arguments, from what I understand, relate to their previous relationships. So the fact that they'd had relationships with other people, there was a lot of jealousy. And this jealousy seems to become a real point of contention, especially, I would imagine, because Dominic Isom had had children with a previous partner. And you can imagine that if you have a partner who has children elsewhere, well, if they're a good partner, they are going to prioritise their children, not you. And I know that that might be contentious to say, but it's true. If you have had a child and then you break up with your partner, you meet somebody else, that new person in your life should not just respect that you have a thread of connection with these incredible beings being your children, they should encourage you to do everything in your power to retain and increase the relationship that they have with those children. And it's really problematic when partners don't do that. Because first of all, if you're in a relationship with somebody who's happy to say goodbye to their kids, you should just get rid of them. Because that says that they ain't going to be committed to anybody. So there was a lot of jealousy, apparently, that related to this topic. And apparently one of the big problems was that Isom had had children with his previous partner. And this really worried Sam. Now, that shows a level of emotional immaturity. Because you have to acknowledge that if you have a partner with children, they need to prioritise their children. And the last thing that you should do is try to create a wedge between them and their kids. Because if you manage to do that, if they're willing to give up their children for you, you shouldn't be with them. Because if they are happy to just let their kids go, then they have commitment issues and your relationship is going to have problems in the long term. And if you make it so toxic for them so they can't see their children, well, in the end, they're going to resent you. So no one wins in that situation. And people who knew the couple said at this point, they started to check each other's phones. They even shared a Facebook account between them. 
And I wouldn't say it's that unusual in our modern dating experience, the modern partnerships, that you don't have access to your partner's phones or media accounts because the truth is in trusting relationships, you've got nothing to hide. So if your partner picks up your phone because they want to go and read the newspaper on it and theirs has died, you're not going to say no and it's not going to suggest that, my God, there are issues in this relationship regarding something like coercive control because you check each other's digital platforms. That's not, for the most part, why people have access to their partner's phones. But if it is for that reason, if you genuinely feel that you have to share a Facebook account because you want to know who is liking posts or who is commenting on posts, you want to have some control over that, or if you're checking phones because you think they're texting people and you're worried that there's an inappropriate relationship going on, that really does suggest a toxicity. And if you're in relationships like that, it doesn't bode well for the future because like it or otherwise, you have to trust your partner. You have to believe that they have positive intentions for you, about you, and a loyalty that is strong between the two of you. But this jealousy is definitely on both sides. So Sam is guilty of it. Isom is guilty of it. And if you think about how they started their relationship, they were already seeing people. So it is quite natural for them to be jealous. And it's quite natural for them to have a potential lack of trust because of the way they started their relationship. If you cheated on your former partners, you're going to think that past behavior is a big predictor of future behavior. And because children are involved, previous partner, can't be completely left in the past, nor should be completely left in the past because there should be a co-parenting dynamic in that scenario. But again, if you are not the most emotionally mature individual, you might struggle with that. And I do think that Sam struggled enormously with it. And she probably wasn't acting in her best interests in the relationship when she was being jealous about the kids because I some can't do anything about the fact that he already has them. But equally, we have to have some sympathy and empathy for Sam because she's young and it's really complicated managing and compartmentalizing all of those challenging emotions that are involved when you think that if your partner is seeing their kids, they might be seeing their ex that they may then rekindle a relationship with. So it chips away at your sense of security in your own world. So as these fractures start to increase, so too does the arguing. And on April the 25th, 2013, Isom actually assaulted Sam. They were arguing over her mobile phone and it was quite a high level assault. He pulled her hair, he forced her over the counter in the kitchen, he crushed her hand as she gripped her phone. And bear in mind, she was pregnant at the time. And when he pushed her onto the counter and over it, like she really hurt her stomach. The baby was okay. But when a partner is willing to put you in a position of danger like that, particularly when you're in a scenario where you're vulnerable because you're pregnant, it speaks volumes because he is not concerned about her safety. He's not concerned about the baby's safety. It's the immediacy he's reacting to. And when somebody acts in this immediate way, it means that they're not consequentially thinking. And if they're not consequentially thinking, well, that's deeply worrying because that means that these kind of things will happen again and again. Because if you're not in control of yourself to the point where you can literally bend somebody who's pregnant over a counter, thus putting them and the baby at risk, then you're clearly not an individual who's thought ahead. And that means that you're operating from a place of rage and emotional dysfunction and dysregulation. And what does that mean? It means that unless something enormous changes, you're going to be a repeat offender within that behavior. So for Sam, that is a red flag. She speaks to her mother about that. She does go and see her mum because she's clearly thinking that she needs to remove the relationship from her life. But what do we see in situations like this time and time again? It genuinely is a tale as old as time. A perpetrator is violent. Then their partner has the strength to leave them, give them a strong consequence. I'm not being treated like that. But that partner, bear in mind, has never experienced or endured the violence prior to this. So this is out of the blue. This is completely left field. This isn't in context with the way that he usually acts around me. So when he calls and says, I'm really sorry, I didn't mean it. I'll never do it again. For that partner who has never had them be violent towards them prior to this, that makes sense. 
And even though you might have heard other people talk about this is how perpetrators begin. They hit you, hurt you, apologize, they will never happen again, a little bit of time goes by, then they hit you and hurt you and so on and so forth. You always think it will be different for me. And Sam believes Isom. She believes that it's just one of those things, it got out of hand, it's never gonna happen again. He professes his undying love for her, no doubt, and she returns. It is such a sad reality that women do this so often. And it's not because they're weak. It is not because they are stupid. It is not because they are victims. It is because they are loving partners who believe the best in the individual who hurt them. And they believe the words when they say it's not gonna happen again. And the problem with that is that the minute they go back to them, a boundary has been breached. And the psychological breach of that boundary for the perpetrator is, I can do this and I can get away with it because they have been ultimately forgiven for the crime. It's why women die every single week in domestic homicide situations, because they believed they wouldn't do it again. If only we were hardwired in a way that if somebody hit you or hurt you, the immediate response was to never see that person again. But life genuinely is never that simple, is it? So she's pregnant now, she's returned to him, obviously hoping to God that their relationship is going to thrive because they love each other, because love can be bad just as much as it can be good. And Sam's hoping that she's gonna have a family and she's gonna thrive and life's gonna work out how she planned. In 2014, things are still not going well. She's really busy, she's working really hard and she's actually starting to get a bit overwhelmed by the expectations in her life and she's started to take antidepressants. She's got a really busy family life and their home life is now getting more and more difficult. Her mother actually talks about the fact that at this point Sam was surviving on energy drinks and cigarettes and that mix is so toxic because energy drinks give you massive spikes of sugar and caffeine and that means that you have ultimately crashes and obviously cigarettes are not going to do very much for you at all and what they are likely to do is to reduce your appetite further so she's lost a lot of weight she's working really hard so she's going to be in a calorie deficit she's going to be exhausted, she's going to be probably feeling deeply anxious and agitated because that's what energy drinks and cigarettes are going to do to you, the most stimulants. So she's on this cycle constantly of being on the psychological edge, so to speak. And that's indicative of somebody who's really struggling on an emotional level. To some degree, in our busy lives, we are all looking for opportunities to take things or be given things that are gonna instantly give us energy and a kick, because it's knackering. Life is a bit knackering, isn't it? We're all so many things to so many people, and it makes perfect sense that, to some degree, you might grab something like an energy drink occasionally, because you're gonna want that caffeine, you're gonna want that kick, and it's gonna be helpful momentarily. But when you are doing that day in, day out, you are self-medicating, it's a way of managing the emotional problems that you are having, but it's counterproductive. So Sam will have felt beside herself a lot of the time because of the stimulants that she's putting in her body, and it's reflective of her life not going in the direction that she wants it to go. But in this day and age, the truth is when people lose weight, you often get complimented, so you don't even get the reinforcement that's required to make you think, this is something that I really need to deal with more effectively. This is something I need to manage because this is something that says my life is going wrong. Because lots of people will be saying how great she looks and arguably to the outside world, that's gonna potentially make her look more successful. And that is counterproductive because she's not gonna get the right kind of support that she requires because this is about her life going wrong. This is about her life becoming more difficult, more problematic. So things are going on in her household. Clearly, the relationship between Isom and her is falling apart. And she's looking at how potentially they can move forward and cement their relationship with foundations that are actually gonna last and where there can be a level of healing to the problems that they're enduring. So she hatches a plan that it would be good for the family to all move to Exeter because she decides that this is where there will be a new start for them. 
So even though there is a crumbling in her life, even though there is a crumbling, even in her physical self, she is still hopeful. And it's really sad when you think about an individual who's been a victim, and we're talking about Sam in that context because there has been violence in this relationship. And the very fact that she is desperately thinking about ways to reignite potentially the sparks or reinvigorate a relationship that's fading, it means that she has a level of responsibility towards her family. And like I said, that's upsetting because it embodies a naivety about the potential harm that she's in. We get to 2015. Sam and Dominique Isom at this point are trying to conceive another child. They were actually talking about adopting a child. Bear in mind, Sam has four children already and they were at this point only aged one, two, four and six. That in itself is a huge amount of responsibility. People said that she was just an incredibly devoted and loving mother. She was a great mum. But can we just take a step back to imagine what that's like to have children one, two, four and six? That's a lot of responsibility. That's a lot of energy required. That's a lot of focus as a parent. And don't get me wrong, Sam was incredibly devoted. She was very loving. According to everybody who knew her, her children were her primary focus. She was absolutely connected to them and her main concern and priority was their well-being and happiness so she's great at being a mum but I've got kids and those of you who know me know that I've got a very new addition to my family and it's absolutely the best thing in the world but I haven't got four under the age of six and one is brilliant and amazing but also takes a lot of responsibility in work. And so she is really dealing with a very busy household, with the marital issues, and also with the expectations around the work that she's doing and how hard she's actually working to bring money in for her family. So this is an enormous amount of potential stress. Add to that the fact that they're trying to have another child, and what does that tell us? It tells us there's almost a desperation, I would say. Because I think what Sam is trying to do is to connect them and embed them as deeply in this family unit so that Isom cannot reject her, cannot abandon her. To make the fabric of the family so indelibly strong between them that he is going to remain. And I do feel that there are such deep insecurities where Sam is concerned. And I do not know how he was being towards her in the relationship because I was not there. But I do feel that she would have had her confidence chipped away by him. I cannot understand why she would have gone from this absolutely fun, loving, loyal, incredibly carefree to some degree individual back in the day to this woman who is now living on energy drinks and cigarettes and desperately thinking about how she can have more children, whether it's adoption, whether it's having more biological children, to embody, look at us, we're a successful family. And when you're doing that, it's often because the fractures are pretty big within. Now, it turns out Dominic Isom at this point had signed a form and he'd signed a form where he'd surrendered his parental rights to the kids that he'd had with a previous partner, which is very disturbing as far as I'm concerned. Now, I appreciate that it's likely that Sam and him were arguing constantly about the fact he was seeing his ex because he had access to the kids and they would be present, etc. And that she does not like that connection. But what you would expect is that Isom would say, no, I'm not going to reject my kids. I'm not going to abandon my kids. And is it wrong of Sam to want Isom to do this? Yes, 100%. It's not acceptable for anybody to demand that you stop seeing your children. But for Sam, she has a family with Dominic Isom. So she's just looking for that. Let's just have this archetypal family. It's mother, it's father, it's kids. She doesn't want the issue, distraction, problems that could be incurred with his additional family. But what you need in that moment is to be able to calmly say to your partner, I'm not giving up my kids. And do it in a way where they understand that they are loved and that their relationship is sacred, but equally so too is the relationship that they have with their children and that it's not acceptable, appropriate or fair to ask them to cut that relationship off. You do that as a mature, emotionally well-balanced individual. You don't go, okay, just for argument's sake, 
I prefer to not get into these altercations with you, so okay, I'll cut off that relationship with my kids. That's a really odd reaction. And some people could look at it and say, well, maybe she was being constantly problematic in his life to a point where it just felt like the easiest road traveled. Well, no, because first of all, that just embodies disloyalty. Secondly, it shows a lack of commitment. And most importantly, it affects kids who don't deserve to have this happen. But for somebody like Sam, who psychologically wants to see in I some loyalty, commitment and all the dedication that she wants for her own children to be reflected in the way that he acts around her and them, him betraying his kids in such a way is actually going to compound her fears. She won't think about that on a psychological level. She'll just think, well, at least I won't have to worry about what he's doing when he's visiting his kids. But what will on an unconscious or subconscious level occur is a deepening of distrust because he has shown his true colours in being willing to abandon his biological children. This is also at a point where Sam and him were going to get married. So they were planning to get married in the June of this year, but they end up scrapping their wedding plans. And it seems like this was likely to do with the fact that they were not managing to formulate a relationship that was that peaceful. There was a lot of chaos. And I think this is when the real undoing and unraveling is occurring. They are both clearly deeply unhappy. And I think that this is why Sam was so desperate to move to Exeter, that this was a way of physically relocating and emotionally relocating all in the same moment. And she's frustrated too, because it's taken longer than she wanted. And she's really serious about this move. So she's in talks with Exeter Council to make sure that they're aware that she wants to push that move as soon as possible. They'd even started to sell some of the furniture. So this was imminent. Now, on January the 22nd, 2015, Sam's mum receives this blind siding call from Dominic. He basically tells her that Sam had gone out the night before and he, she hadn't returned that morning. So her mum immediately is like, I'm coming over and you need to call the police. You need to call the police and tell them that Sam is missing. This is completely out of character. So... That's what he does. He rings the police, he reports a missing. And during the 999 call, he's asked the question, have you argued? And he said that they didn't row at all. And you're like, well, in the history of every relationship, that's impossible. We all row. No one doesn't row at all. You can pretend you don't, but we all know relationships endure conflict. Successful relationships survive in spite of it. Not because it doesn't occur. How's it say? Hi, uh, I haven't got any credit to phone the 101 number, but um, I've been told to phone you this morning. Um, but my, my partner, my girlfriend's gone, well, she hasn't gone missing, but she's gone. She went last night and she hasn't come back this morning. We've got four children. I, I, right. I spoke to my mum in law, her mum, and she just told me to phone the police. Right, so what exactly has happened? I don't really know. I've been trying to rattle my mind, trying to think what, where she'd go, what she'd do. I haven't got any credit on my phone. I can't phone anybody. I don't. I've got four children in the house. I need to get them all ready and go to the shop. It's <laughs> freezing cold. <laughs> right. Where was she last night? She was here last night. Yeah. It was around about half four she left. I'm not too sure that exactly. No, it wasn't last night. It was yesterday evening because it was dark when she left. I'm just... <laughs> My mind's all over the place trying to think. Yeah, where, oh, what I'm asking you is where she went. When she went out, where did she go? I don't know. I don't know. She didn't right. tell me. She right, there so wasn't she... a planned thing. She wasn't on a night out with some friends. Oh, or... no, 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 no. She doesn't go out. She doesn't drink. She doesn't... We're, we're like family, just couple, living couples. Yeah. What's, what's the matter? So there's something you're holding back? No, I'm trying to think what it would be. Uh, they haven't spoke for months, but I'm... Right. Make sure my kids are right, because they're all in the front room. I've got a one-year-old, two-year-old, four-year-old, and six-year-old. Right, okay. What's your girlfriend's name? It's Samantha Henderson. Samantha Henderson? Yeah, she's recently changed it to them, but you probably got her on the system as Henderson. So, no, I, wasn't, I didn't even think about phoning the emergency, because she hasn't been gone for 24 hours, but I'm getting quite worried now. Is it unusual for her to go out in the afternoon and not come back all night? Um, well, she's never done it before. She's never done this before. In the whole, like, three, three and a half years we've been together nearly, she's never done it. She's gone off and she's gone for a couple of hours and, and she'd come back and she might be all right, but 
it's never done it's never done like, overnight in right so when she left yesterday what was said beforehand um she couldn't handle things everything's getting way too much that nothing's going her way it's not happening quick enough right but i've been trying to rattle my brain all night last night and Okay, so you didn't have a row exactly, but she was really no, down no, yesterday. No, no, we haven't, we haven't had a row. We haven't had no, we didn't row at all. Also, he's now sending Sam text messages saying things like, Sam, I can't do this on my own, and I fell asleep at the window last night waiting for you to come back. Now, call me a little bit on the suspicious side, chaps, but... If I see messages like that, I feel like this isn't for the person who's meant to be reading it. This is dramatic. It's a touch of the drama, isn't it? It's sounding very much like from a Shakespeare play. Oh, I can't do this on my own. I fell asleep at the window last night waiting for you to come back and so on and so forth. Forsooth, my lord. Do you know what I mean? It just feels a little bit too dramatic. Also, he was leaving voicemails, and in his voicemails, he's crying, and he's like, I need you back here, Sam, I love you so much, please, come home. So just bear all this in mind. Bear all this in mind. Because for me, it's really symbolic of an individual's character when they can play these things and act in this way. It's like a role that they've decided to take on. And it speaks of something really dark and malevolent when we actually look at the reality of what's played out. But Sam's mum really does know that something pretty dreadful has likely happened to her daughter. She just has that feeling. And most importantly, she is very aware that this is not the way that Sam would normally act. And to anybody who loves anybody in their family, you have a system of understanding about the way that their actions are. And when they deviate from that, it's disturbing because it's unusual. And when it's unusual in this way, often it speaks of something sinister that's played out. Now, when the police question those who know Sam, it turns out that she'd been seen by others about 3 p.m. the day before, so that was January the 21st, and she was seen collecting her kids from school. Now, time-wise, just after, it seems that her phone battery had been removed from her phone, so that was just before 4 p.m. Then at 4.30 p.m., that same day on the 21st, Sam's friend Kelly drops by her house, but Sam isn't there. Dominic Isom answers the door, and he literally says to her friend, Sam's gone and done one, indicating that Sam has purposefully and willfully left of her own volition. But Kelly is like, this feels really off. And one of the things that strikes her is there's this strong smell of bleach in the house. Then as she's leaving, Isam actually says to her, I'm sorry for everything. This stays with Kelly because it's out of character for him to act this way. And it's unnerving because now she knows that her friend isn't present. There's this smell of bleach and Dominic Isom is apologising for everything, but there isn't necessarily anything that she's expecting an apology for. On January the 23rd, Dominic Isom is taken in by the police and interviewed. He was asked to go to the station voluntarily and he does, because bear in mind, he's the last person to have seen Sam, so he needs to give a witness statement, give them all the information that could help him bring in a home. And it's literally that same day he's arrested in connection with Sam's murder. So they move quick and he says, I don't understand. I haven't done anything to Sam. And then he literally begins to cry. So he's playing the card at this moment in time that he has been wrongfully arrested. He doesn't know what on earth the authorities are on about and that he's very distressed by this. So again, playing this role, acting as if he's an innocent bystander in this awful scenario where his lover, his partner, his wife-to-be has just disappeared and now people are blaming him for it. Then we get to January the 24th. This is where he's interviewed again. He's had a little bit of time to think, hasn't he? A little bit of time to think. A little bit of time to think about the movements of the day where Sam disappeared. So he then comes up with this story and says, okay, I'm going to be honest with you now. I actually had 
gone somewhere. I hadn't just been at my home. I'd actually driven because I wanted to buy cannabis. Then I went to Sam's ex-boyfriend's house in Hamworthy because I wanted to check if she was potentially there. So he's throwing in this breadcrumb trail, which is suggesting, okay, I've been a bit naughty. I did something a bit illegal. That's why I haven't told you. I bought drugs and that is meant to evidence this is why I've been deceptive because I didn't want you police officers to realise that I was somebody who was using recreational marijuana. That, he believes, will make him seem like he's innocent because he's implicated himself in kind of a crime, low-level drugs, and will also explain why he hasn't necessarily come forward with the truth. And then throwing in the Sam's ex-boyfriend thing, again, well, you know, let's give this idea of a legitimate reasoning behind why I would travel somewhere because Sam's ex-boyfriend is somebody that she could have sought solace from after an argument and so on and so forth. So he's cleverly trying to create this fabric of possibility regarding why he wasn't where he'd said initially he was, which was at home. But the police clearly don't think that any of that makes sense. And it really doesn't because you wouldn't have to admit to buying cannabis. You'd just say you'd driven to a particular place, wouldn't you? So the police are quickly onto the fact that that makes no sense. And even the same with Sam's ex-boyfriend, it wouldn't be an issue. You can just admit to wherever you've been. There is literally nothing problematic about driving anywhere, unless of course you're trying to hide something. We get to January the 25th and at this point Isom is interviewed again and then he starts to talk about where they might want to look for Sam because she apparently liked visiting Durlston Country Park in Swanage and says, you know, go look there. So he's even giving them ideas of where she may be, which again, makes no sense because I'm just going to throw it out there. You might like to go for a visit to a park. It might be one of your favourite places, but usually you come home. You know, no matter how much, I really like this park, I, I, I really like this park is somewhere I really like. I'm going to spend three days in this, three days on this bench looking at this park that I really like. No one's going to care that I'm just sitting here on this bench in the park I really like, whilst my family wondering where the hell I am. You know, it just, no, this does not make sense. Now, the police are scouring CCTV footage to try to find out exactly what's happened to Sam. And it doesn't take them long to turn up footage that showed Isom driving Sam's car on the same night that she'd apparently left. When they tracked the phone records, location also showed him to be close to a lake at Hamworthy. So now they're starting to get really concerned because he's lying to them. He's driving Sam's car and he's in a place that he hasn't indicated he's been. And that's sinister. And investigators know that it's really likely at this point that something awful has happened to Sam. So the phone records basically show him on January the 21st around 10.30 p.m. around that lake. And he says, wait for it, this is the guy who's been able to construct some ideas of why he'd been not at home and how he'd been going to score weed and how he'd been driving to see the ex-boyfriend of Sam and so on. But now he's confronted with his actual movements. Oh, suddenly he has no idea. I have no idea. You have no idea. I have no idea, zero idea, nada idea, none at all. Well, I think you'll find it's because you were there. I know that that is how it would look technologically and probably sound on a logic sense and maybe even be seen on CCTV. But I'm saying I wasn't there and I don't know how it happened. We, li we literally have... We have it all. We know where you were. I'm thinking that the person I went to score cannabis, oh, sorry, no, it'll be the ex, the ex of Sam's, stole my phone, then drove everywhere with it in a how to implicate me in a crime that I don't even know has happened. And then they managed to get it back to me without me knowing. I literally don't know how to respond to such stupidity.
I'm just, I'm just gonna shut up. Just, shh. that's what I'm gonna do. I'm just gonna shh. Just close it down. Nonsense. Pile of absolute isom nonsense. But this is what he's saying. Plain the, I don't know who did it. I don't know what's happened. I don't know anything. Now, the other thing that is clearly going to concern the police is that Isom's got a scratch on his neck. And it's what they always go for, isn't it? You can see police officers, when they get into interrogations, they are looking at the way that somebody's hands look, necks look, face look, because you can see if there are any injuries. And they can see this scratch. And a scratch is going to look really suspicious because it would look like somebody was trying to defend themselves by scratching you, by fighting back. And when the police officer questions him about this, he said that one of his kids had done it by accident, which I suppose is a relatively appropriate excuse. I mean, kids do occasionally scratch you, so it could be a reality. But what is unusual is after he discloses this, he then becomes absolutely hysterical. And I think he's had some time to mull over the problems that we've got going on, which is his phone has been tracked in places he hasn't said he was. So therefore now his deception seems to be obvious to the investigators. So the hysteria, I feel, comes from, shall we say, a touch of the amateur dramatics. And he's thinking, how do I convince these police officers that I am not a murderer, for example? How do I show them that I'm this loving partner and that I'm desperately worried about the woman that has walked away from me? How can I express that whilst also, I don't know, coordinating my technology with where the police have found my technology to have been? So he says... On January the 21st, he'd actually gone to a car park near the lake intending to hang himself. And he yelled in true dramatic style, she'll see me dead and she'll come back. Like, honestly, can we just take a minute to deconstruct the reality of what's just been said? So, your explanation is, Isom, that your partner walks out on you isn't gone for weeks, you know, this is pretty immediate. And as opposed to you just sitting back and being like, well, hopefully she'll just come home at the end of the day, all relationships have problem. You're like, well, I'll make sure she comes home by hanging myself immediately and not actually being there to see her come home. But because I've killed myself, she's now coming home, even though I won't know because I'm dead. Ugh. this is the logic that the investigators are having to manage in that moment. Can you imagine how they would feel? I know it's not appropriate to slap somebody across the face in an interrogation, but you know in the true 1920s style where somebody gets a bit hysterical, you just give them a good smack across the face to bring them back to their senses. They'd get sued now. They'd, they'd lose their jobs, wouldn't they? But back in the day, that was just seen in an appropriate manner to manage a situation such as this. Maybe with Isom, you'd do it quite hard, as just for good measure to make sure that he definitely came back to his said senses. But you can see, this makes no sense whatsoever. If he killed himself, he'd never know that she came home. If he killed himself, his kids wouldn't have a father. If he killed himself, she, who may, in this scenario, in a normal situation, just have gone for a breather, would also be dealing with the suicide of her partner and probably blaming herself. So none of that makes sense whatsoever, but he's desperately trying to create and carve this scenario which makes sense of where his technology has tracked him. Sadly, on the 30th of January, the police are proven right and Sam's body was found in Hamworthy Lake by a team who included divers and sniffer dogs. Clearly, they were very concerned when they saw his phone had been in that area that he had likely brought great harm to Sam. When they found her, she was wearing her pink dressing gown. She was wrapped in a pink children's Hello Kitty duvet. And it was clear when they looked at her body that she'd suffered some really severe injuries to her head and neck. And the actual cause of death was blunt force injuries. So she got really extensive injuries to her neck. And they believe that that was to do with the pressure that had been placed on her neck. So she'd been being choked, strangled, etc. And she had died in a really violent attack and that attack had mostly been directed to her head and to her neck and when her mother found out about this she could not believe it she didn't believe that her daughter was dead she believed that she would walk in she couldn't comprehend that her daughter was not coming home to her 
she just couldn't believe that the child that she brought into this world had been taken in such a monstrous and diabolical way by a man that she had had within her life because Isom is obviously a violent predator and her mother did have concerns about him. She knew that he'd been violent to her before. She certainly didn't stop her from going back to him, but that was because she felt that she had to allow Sam to make decisions over her own life. It didn't mean that she was happy with her returning when he'd been violent to her. And to all intents and purposes, she was genuinely believing that their relationship could find a place of balance. And Sam had all these plans to go and start a new life in Exeter. And her mother would have been watching this play out without any idea of just how dangerous the situation was for Sam. And to suddenly have it fall about your ears, your entire world, it was blindsiding beyond belief. And the guilt that she'll feel as a mother, because you will, when you have a child who's killed by a domestic homicide incident, you always think, what could I have done? I should have done more. And it's not your fault. You're not the perpetrator. But it's the natural way that we try to manage our environment. We think, well, if I could have controlled it better, this would never have happened because we want to make ourselves feel less vulnerable in life. So we figure out that if we're the ones who made the mistake, then maybe we can adapt and change our behavior and we won't make those mistakes again. But that really, in these scenarios, is something that can just destroy us because it wasn't her fault. It was his fault. And she never believed he was capable of the horror that he's absolutely capable of. We get to July the 13th, 2016. This is when the trial begins. And of course, as we know with these kind of perpetrators, when it comes down to admitting guilt, well, he's not going to do it. Isom denies murder. Instead, he says, look, yes, I know that I killed her, but I didn't murder her. I am completely responsible for causing the injuries which resulted in her death, but it wasn't premeditated. I didn't intend to kill her and so on and so forth. Now, during the trial, Ison gave an account of the chain of events that led to Sam's death. And it is unbelievable that I even have to say these words, but Ison tried to suggest that he'd acted in self-defense. Self-defense. This guy is a big guy. Sam is a slight woman, and he's saying that it was self-defense. The only way you could imagine this being self-defense is if she was shooting him and missed at the time, because when we're talking about physicality, she would not stand a chance. So his story is that he's smoking on the back patio, and then he hears Sam being aggressive towards one of the children. So like a hero, like the wonderful father he is, he decides to go and see what's playing out. He doesn't want one of his kids to be harmed by Sam, the monster that she really is. And apparently when he goes in, there she is, curled with her hands around the child's throat. So badly this child is being attacked that the child's lips were blue. I mean, what universe? How big is this cigarette, by the way? How long has he been on the path? Is he chain smoking? Because let me tell you, for an altercation to take place while somebody's sparked up a cigarette to the point where it's escalated so quickly, because he'd have been inside, wouldn't he? He would have been inside the house and he would have got his cigarettes, walked outside to have a cigarette. That's why he's on the patio. So the argument would either have been happening because to get to a point where it's gone from an altercation, a disagreement to somebody choking a child out for a period of time where their lips have turned blue and all this whilst he's just having a cigarette. It's just ludicrous. It's ludicrous. On a time frame logic level, it makes absolutely no sense. But this is what we're meant to believe, that she was basically killing her child in the kitchen. So then he's desperate because it turns out that Sam may actually be the Incredible Hulk. The fact that she's this slight woman, irrelevant. In this moment, it seems that she has super strength and she's choked this child all but to death in a matter of seconds, apparently. So he goes in, intervenes, pulls Sam away from the child, and then she grabs the door frame, he slips, which he said, quote, catapulted Sam over one of his shoulders. Just 
Yeah, we'll go through that one again. So she grabs the door frame, he slips, and then somehow that movement catapults. Remember what the word is? Catapults. You know what a catapult is? You know, where you pull it back and somebody just like flies over, like in some kind of circus act. Catapults her over one of his shoulders. And at this point, she's catapulted clearly very fast and very hard. And she allegedly hits her head on the shed, which was in the garden. And this causes a 9.5 centimetre cut on her forehead because of the impact of this. Like, just work that out. So we are actually meant to believe that somehow the slip projects her over his shoulder and she impacts so forcefully on the shed door that now she's got this huge gash in her head. I kid you not, at that point, if I had been listening to this in court, I would genuinely have had to get a taser. No, sorry, you're not allowed to do that, Emma. It's illegal. You'd never have got through security. You know what I'm saying, though. A bit frustrating. I wonder what the prosecution were thinking. Probably, oh, thank God I took this case. I am going to like destroying this man. And the defence would be sitting there just internally shaking their heads going, why? Why? Why, why did I become a defence barrister for this case why nothing about this story is made catapults over the shoulder unbelievable but yeah and now it gets even better because you would imagine if somebody's been catapulted over somebody's shoulder smacked the head really hard on the shed gashed the head to a startling degree you know 10 centimeter gash basically means that that person is going to be in agony and also potentially in imminent danger of losing their life but no not sam Sam, at this point, grabs him by the throat and says, I'm going to kill you. I mean, this isn't just ludicrous. It's actually embarrassing. And if this wasn't in reference to the murder of a defenceless young woman, we could almost see it as comedic because it's so ridiculous. But we are actually talking about this in reality of a murder. And he somehow believes that by deriding her reputation as a mother in court and by lying about the violence that allegedly she engaged in, that he may just get off with this crime. What kind of a human being does this? What kind of a human being goes out of their way to literally try to tarnish the reputation of an innocent woman who's died horribly in a way of saving himself? It's just grotesque. As it is grotesque that earlier on he is deflected and lied and tried to make out that she's abandoned the family and that he's the victim, almost taking his own life and so on and so forth. This individual is an absolute liar beyond belief. And now we're expected to have this belief that she had the physical strength and domination to scare him. And even if by some bizarre miracle she was able to get up after being so badly injured and grab him around the neck with her hands and say, I'm going to kill you, physically, he would have been able to restrain her and remove those hands immediately because there was a complete power imbalance. Physically, he was so strong. So he then says at the point where she's done this, he decides to put his hands around her neck, which must have, quote, accidentally caused her to die accidentally yes you just accidentally caught if if you're not three times a week accidentally causing somebody to die what are you doing with your week guys i mean we've all done it haven't we we've all accidentally caused somebody to die particularly with our own hands you know if i'm not accidentally choking people to death i don't know whether it's a wednesday it just makes no sense. But this is what he says, just casually. It's like a casual, I casually killed somebody. I just casually killed somebody. I didn't mean to. I just, I casually, I casually choked them to death with my arm or casually choked them to death with my hand. It was just casual. It was an accidental, casual error. That's all I'm saying. Let me go. Let me go. Ugh. Anyway, again, this is what he says that he casually, sorry, that's me saying, he accidentally caused her to die and he didn't mean to do it. Apparently Sam was slumped against the wall of the shed at this point. Her head was bleeding very heavily 
And he then thinks, well, what am I going to do? So he goes inside and he locks the door so that she can't get back inside. And he said, at this point, he said, I just wanted to get away from Sam. What? You accidentally killed her, but now you're locking her out, even though she can't come after you and you want to get away from her. You just killed her. It's a really odd reaction, and even in court, it's making no sense. Then he apparently changed his clothes, checked on the kids, goes back and clarifies that she's basically unresponsive, doesn't have a pulse. At this point, you would think, I don't know. Let's just go into the realms of what Isom is trying to weave a web of here. Let's just give him the good old benefit of the doubt and say he went back after believing that he just choked her out and given himself some distance from her because she's become this violent individual that he's never known before in their relationship. He's locked himself in the house, made sure the kids are safe. Remember, he's a hero, making sure the kids are safe, particularly the one who was no doubt near death because their lips were blue because someone had apparently been choking that child. But then he goes out, sees whether she's calmed down, finds that she's dead. What are you going to do? Bear in mind, you're innocent. It's not your fault that she was catapulted into the shed. It's not your fault that you choked her to death whilst you were trying to protect yourself from being killed by her. You've got lots of reasons for defence. Oh, she came at me for no reason. She threatened to kill me for no reason. I had to protect myself. This is a complete accident and so on and so forth. You would just be like, emergency services, call the emergency services. You've done nothing wrong. You're an innocent victim. But that's not what he does. He doesn't attempt to help her. He doesn't call an ambulance. He doesn't do any of the things that an individual who is innocent would do. Instead, because he's this victim and he's done nothing wrong, he wraps her up in polythene and a duvet, then puts stone slabs in with her to weigh her down, also puts her phone with the battery taken out in there with her, also his slippers, they've been covered in blood and he was wearing those, so basically he put those in the package with Sam's body. Then he cleans up the house using bleach and water because that's what every innocent person does who's done nothing wrong, isn't it? I'll just get rid of any incriminating things from the scene of the crime because there wasn't a crime, right? You were innocent, why would you be cleaning up? But then he puts her body in the car with everything I've just said, drives to the car park at the lake, then he wades into the lake and dumps her body in the water. The mother of his children. He literally weighs her down, hoping that her body will sink to the bottom of the water, never be found, and it will just seem that she had willingly abandoned her kids. And all this, even though he's an innocent individual. Like, we see crimes of passion happen. We see individuals make horrible errors and it causes the loss of life. And we see that they call the police and they admit their guilt and they're broken because of it. And it doesn't excuse it. They're still a violent perpetrator. They still absolutely 100% deserve what is coming to them with a very strong, long sentence. But if you are somebody who has apparently accidentally killed your partner, and then the way that you process that is to literally think about getting rid of their body, disposing of their body, cleaning the crime scene, and then hoping that no one's gonna find out. That's not because you feel responsibility or guilt towards that individual. All you feel is the egomania about protecting yourself. The only person that matters in the world is you, your freedom. You don't care about the fact that kids have lost the parent. You don't care about the fact that you've stolen the chance for the family to say goodbye to that person because if the body's never found, they'll never have that closure. All that you care about, ultimately, is your freedom. And if you didn't intend to kill them, then why would you go to such lengths to cover it up? Prosecutor Ian Laurie, he just ripped the explanation that Ison gave apart. He said it was 
the weirdest explanation. He said it was peculiar, frankly bizarre, and didn't make sense. He also commented that Sam would have been absolutely stunned after sustaining the wound to the head because it would have been bleeding profusely. It would have been very traumatic for her. And he said that it would have been easy for Dominic to push Sam's hand away from his neck because physically he was so much stronger. He also questioned how the hell Sam had been catapulted into the shed. He said, you're just making this up and it's obvious. And he said that all the explanations that he'd given could not withstand scrutiny. I mean, they're laughable. And like I said, they genuinely would be comedic if we weren't talking about such a reprehensible reality that this woman, this mother, this loving family member had lost her life so horribly. It's also established that all of Sam's injuries wouldn't have been caused by a single accident or slamming to the shed because understandably that injury would be one and there were more and there were very few if any defensive injuries. So that demonstrates that as opposed to her apparently going for him and fighting with him that she was obviously overpowered because there wasn't defence wounds. She hadn't put up a struggle or a fight. She'd obviously been incapacitated very quickly. Now, when the prosecution asked Dominic Isom to explain all the other injuries that Sam sustained, this is where Dominic Isom suddenly has convenient amnesia. You know, I remember this bit, but not that bit. I remember the bit that makes me look like a victim, but not the bit that makes me look like a perpetrator. I remember the bit that makes my story add up, but the bit that makes it fall apart, I don't have any memory of that whatsoever. And the prosecution are really frustrated because it's very clear that he's doing the worst cover-up possible, but nonetheless, he's still trying to cover up his crime. And if you're trying to cover up your crime, you're not taking accountability, you're not being responsible, and that means that you're a very dangerous human being. So he kept repeating when he was questioned about those injuries. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. And he flat out refused to admit that it hit Sam. Sam's blood, by the way, was found in the shed. It was found on a lawnmower. It was found on shelving. It was found on a bike. It was found on a football. And the spatter patterns of the blood indicated that Sam had actually been on the floor of the shed. And that's where she was attacked by Dominic. And the aggression and violence involved in that attack is demonstrated by how her blood had been splattered over all of those items. Now, Detective Inspector Neil Devoto, he described the attack as cowardly, brutal and sustained. It's an absolutely horrible reality that those last moments that Sam endured were on that cold shed floor being killed by the man that she simply wanted a future with. Dominic said that he didn't mean for any of it to happen. But what I think he's saying there is that he didn't mean for it to happen because he didn't mean for him to get caught. You know, on reflection, it screwed up his life and he's egocentric. He cares about himself and everybody else. We know that because he gave up his kids, for example, to give him an easier life. That's the kind of individual that we're talking about right now. So saying he didn't mean for any of it to happen is merely reflective reality. He's looking back and thinking, well, life's not going to be very good for me now. I wish I hadn't done it. He's not thinking about stealing Sam from her children. He's simply thinking about the freedom that he's going to lose. When he's questioned, well, OK, why didn't you actually talk to the police about the apparent accident? He said, oh, well, I didn't talk to the police about that because I didn't want the kids to have no parents. Well, sorry. First of all, you've given up your own children, so you don't seem to have a problem with that anywhere else. But also, you hiding the body, you've made it worse. You've implicated yourself far deeper. And you would have been willing to deny the children knowing what had happened to their mother. They would have believed that she'd just walked out on them. And that's a mental scar that a child shouldn't have to carry when it isn't true. And they also question, well, if that's the case, why did you spend so much time lying to the police? Why did you deliberately mislead the investigators? Why did you choose not to confess? And he said, I was too much of a coward to admit it. I knew what needed to be said, but I didn't do it. Yeah, OK, fair enough. But why then did you make all those numerous phone calls? You know, you literally rang up and left messages on a phone of Sam's saying that you missed her terribly, that you wanted a home, that you were crying by the window, that you almost took your own life and so on and so forth. This fabric of deception is enormous. 
this is when you knew that you had killed her. So understandably, nothing that he's saying is making any sense whatsoever. He went out of his way, not just to fail to admit what had happened, but to try to cover it up to such a degree that he was making false phone calls to Sam to try to suggest that he was grieving for her, leaving him, when ultimately he knew that he'd murdered her on the shed floor. And he also called around places like he called friends, he called businesses where Sam worked, even called Exeter Council because they're planning to move there. All of this is another attempt to divert blame away from himself. And as his phone records would show, he was tirelessly trying to find her according to all those calls he made. But he knew she was never coming home. Sam was dead because he'd killed her. Dominic Ison was sentenced to life in prison. He was sentenced to 17 years minimum. Judge Dingeman said that there were a lot of aggravating factors in this case. So first of all, he'd attacked Sam in the past. The fact that he had a body after killing her, the numerous lies that he told, which just prolonged the agony of the children and the family. Also, Dominic Isom's had 20 previous convictions against him, including gross bodily harm. In one instance, he'd attacked a man with a golf club. He'd caused fractured ribs and a collapsed lung. Bear that in mind. As far as I'm concerned, that is someone who even then had the capacity to kill. The judge also commented that only Dominic Isom's knows what really triggered the murder, though it wasn't premeditated. The catalyst is something that Dominic hasn't ever actually revealed. The judge also said that genuine remorse is not usually accompanied by lying accusations, which Dominic Isom's had loads of. I mean, he was literally saying that Sam was somebody who was the perpetrator and he was the victim. And the judge also said that whilst he believes that he didn't intend to kill Sam that day, he certainly intended to cause her harm. And in light of what I've just told you about prior convictions, this man had a predator at his very core. The local community were absolutely devastated by Sam's loss and they set up a fund for Samantha's children. It raised over £6,000 and in a statement by a family, they said, Sam was a kind, happy, fun-loving and outgoing person. She loved being a mother and doted on her four young children. They desperately missed their mummy. I mean, we have to remember that the true victims here, aside from Sam, aside from obviously her loving family members, are those kids those kids that she absolutely adored. They've had her stolen from their life and their father taken as well. I'm not sure that that kind of flappy appendage would ever be that useful in a child's life, but genuinely, when it comes down to Sam, she was absolutely loving towards those children. She worked hard for them. She wanted a future bringing them up and that's been taken. The family said, we are all devastated about what has happened and are still struggling to come to terms with our loss. We have gained strength from the many members of the community who rallied together to help us. Such a sad case, such a massive loss, and so unnecessary. There is something about the rage within these predators, so unpredictable, so aggressive, so brutal. Dominic Isom is a perpetrator of the highest level. He's a domestic abuser, and he embodies everything we expect to see within a domestic abuser. He's a liar. He makes himself the victim. He uses force to get what he wants. And when he doesn't get what he wants, he punishes you further. And for Sam, a woman who was imperfect as we all are, but who genuinely wanted a future with him, she was willing to forgive the very traits that eventually would destroy her. Because Sam's initial reaction when she first left him because he hurt her, that was the right one. Stories like this again and again need to be told. They need to be told because somebody potentially watching this one day will hear things and see connections that they enjoy in their own life and realise that they don't deserve to be put in positions when their life is in danger. These situations where people are domestically abused, they tend not to end well. And we have to remember that if somebody is capable of hurting you physically in a relationship, then they are capable of killing you. And it can be a difficult stretch to make because you think, not my partner, he'll be different or she'll be different, but they aren't. If you can raise a hand to a partner, if you can beat a partner, then you can kill a partner. It's just a matter of time. And sadly, for so many women and men in these relationships, that time 
ultimately runs out. Samantha deserved so much more, but in the end she was met with brutality and tragedy on the cold shed floor. And now her children are growing up without her. I hope that Dominic Isom rots in jail. I know he won't. He'll be afforded his freedom at some point in the future. But leopards like him, they really don't change their spots. And our society and women in general won't be safe when perpetrators like him are walking our streets. I'd really like to know your thoughts. If you are affected by this kind of abuse in your relationship, the one thing that I will tell you is get out. It's hard. It's really challenging to leave an abusive relationship, but you are worth more and your life is worth far more. If Samantha can be something to you, let her be a legacy of your freedom. Freedom that she sadly got denied. Take care guys. Let me know your thoughts on this case in the comments below. I'll see you again. Be safe.